Hello, everybody. Welcome to Balkwell's Books. Uh, my name is Balkwell. I'm the host of this show, Balkwell's Books. This month we are doing part two. This is part two of our two-part series on Damien by Herman Hesse. Last month in part one, we introduced the idea of the overman in the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, which is a major influence or inspiration for this novel. We introduced our main character, Emile Sinclair, his conception of the two worlds, the bright world and the dark world. We talked about his early life, and we got to the point where he meets his mentor, Max Damien. Max Damien tells him a few... Uh, Tells him a lot of strange things, and then abandons him. So we are now at the midpoint of our journey, and we find Emile Sinclair left to fend for himself in the world. Like any good student, after leaving the tutelage of his master, Emile immediately forgets all he has been taught, and falls into a life of total debauchery. Emile finds that he is slightly ahead of the new students at his or the students at his new school and is unwelcome by them due to his melancholic and aloof attitude he has grown physically from a gentle child to a misshapen adolescent and is right in the midst of those awkward gangly years when one's mass struggles to keep up with one's height in the same way, Emile's spiritual maturity has not been able to keep up with his new role as an independent and free man. He looks down on the students around him, and in a way attempts to emulate Damien by remaining isolated. But unlike Damien, Emile has nothing within himself to fall back on, so his solitude is empty of any meaning, and instead merely a source of depression. With the gentle encouragement of an older student he meets in the park, Emile turns to drink, and very quickly finds himself an unrepentant alcoholic. Although drinking is not pleasant to him, and he never gets used to it enough to not feel dearly the after-effects, he sees no other way to escape the gloom of his inner life. On top of this, the drink gives him the power to talk, and while he struggles to think straight, he realizes that he can talk well enough to feel like a man who knows what he's about. Damien had warned Emile at the end of the previous chapter about such empty talk. He says, quote, Smart talk has no value, none at all. It just leads you away from yourself. With every drunken night, Emile is running further and further away from himself. Every time he looks out the window, there he is running away from himself. He trots out Damien's theories at the pub, his interpretation of Cain and Abel and the thief on the cross, but they don't mean anything in this context. They're just verbal games. Damien was very particular about telling Emile the stories that would help him develop. Emile, instead, tells stories simply for the fun of it. It's just smart talk. Emile falls into debt, he struggles to keep up with his schoolwork, and despite holding court night after night at the tavern, he is lonely. The bright world he abandoned so long ago no longer even feels real. When his father visits to admonish him for his poor grades, Emil finds that he can't care less what his father thinks. Damien's world, the world that transcends the bright and the dark, similarly ceases to have any meaning. Emile begins to resent Damien for abandoning him. Without Damien, there is no spiritual journey, there's no development, just a big pit for Emile to fall into. Emile starts to feel like there's just no place for a person like him in the world, and he decides that it's not his fault, but the world's. 
At the brink of expulsion from his school, at the nadir of his material and spiritual well-being, Emile is walking through the park where he had first met with the older student who led him on his first drinking binge. You may start to notice at this point that Emile is always being pulled one way or another, that he only casts off one tempter to place himself firmly in the hands of another. From Cromer to Damien, from Damien to alcohol, Emile now finds in the same place where his, his drunkenness began a new form of intoxication. It arrives in the form of a young woman. Emile doesn't know her name, so he decides to refer to her as Beatrice, a reference to Dante, for whom his long-term crush Beatrice served as a symbol for beauty, love, and grace. Emile notes that he hadn't actually read Dante when he decides on this name, but had only seen a painting of her by a British artist, who my edition notes as Dante Gabriele Rossetti. It doesn't really sound very British, but oh well. He describes the Beatrice in the painting as displaying, quote, that slenderness and boyishness of forms that I loved. It is at this point that it seems reasonable to take a good look at Emile's sexuality. When he begins going out drinking with his classmates, Emile always finds himself uncomfortable with a certain topic, that of girls and the things that go on between boys and girls, that secret, forbidden, and disgusting thing. Emile never quite accustoms himself to sexual life. He blushes at the stories and the jokes, and seems afraid of the idea of the sexual world existing in the same world as everything else. It is perhaps one of the features of his upbringing, and of his bright world, dark world cosmology, that causes him to struggle so much to break down this barrier. It is not much of a leap to say that Emile doesn't seem to be attracted to women. While he often speaks of girls or women when discussing his sexuality, these seem to be mere metaphors for the object of his attraction, rather than the object itself. Aside from Beatrice and, well, even including Beatrice, he never shows any interest in a real woman, but instead in the ideal of a womanly being. And I'll, I'll get to that more when we discuss Lady Eve in the, later in the episode. Beatrice, by which I mean the real person whose name is not actually Beatrice, isn't the object of Emile's affection, and this very quickly becomes clear. Emile, as is his wont, quickly abstracts his relationship to her, just like he did with Cromer when he transformed him into his personal Satan. Beatrice, on the other hand, becomes a deity, or, at the very least, an idol. In this way, Emile frees himself from the bestial passions of drink and lust. His goal becomes, quote, not pleasure, but purity, not happiness, but beauty and intellectuality. Due to her angelic influence, Emile shuns drink and becomes more comfortable in solitude. Emile takes up painting at this point. And it is via this medium that we begin to understand what Beatrice, the symbol, truly means. He begins by painting neutral subjects, such as pots, flowers, and imaginary landscapes. Eventually, he gathers the courage to attempt to paint his love, Beatrice. He first tries to paint her as she exists in reality, but finds all these attempts inadequate. He then allows himself to paint unconsciously, and from within his imagination emerges a painting that speaks to him more than any he has made in the past. This painting is a portrait, but it's no longer of Beatrice. He's no longer even trying to paint Beatrice. Instead, he is painting his true love, that love for which Beatrice is merely a stand-in. Her boyish androgyny has given way to what is clearly a young man's face. A face, quote, a little stiff and mask-like, 
but impressive and full of secret life. This is, of course, Max Damien. It takes Emil some time to recognize this fact, but to us, that's clear as day. Beatrice was never his idol. She was never the ideal that he was chasing. It was Damien. It was always Damien. Even as he drank himself into oblivion, it was Damien he was trying to emulate. It was Damien he was trying to reach. But we can't stop here. The, the solution to Emile's problem is not that he's secretly gay, although it's very likely that he is gay and in love with Max Damien. There's, there's more going on here as well as that. As Emile stares more and more into the picture and sees it in new lights, he realizes that its resemblance to Damien too is somewhat superficial. What he has truly painted is a self-portrait. Quote, The picture didn't resemble me, he says, nor was it meant to, but it depicted that which constituted my life. It was my inner self, my fate, or my demon. This clearly points us toward the true nature of Max Damien. Whether Damien truly exists, or whether he is only a sort of figment of Emile's imagination, is left ambiguous, and the answer probably lies somewhere in the middle. It's likely that Max Damien is a real person, but that, like Beatrice, Emile has ascribed to him meaning and power that he doesn't truly possess in reality. In this book, we only ever get Emile's perspective, and we've seen in the past that this perspective doesn't always accurately reflect reality. His naive perception of his family, as well as his idea that Cromer actually believed his story about the apple orchard, point to the fact that Emile might not be the most reliable source as to what's truly happening on Earth. In the following paragraph, Emile brings up a quote from Novalis, an 18th century German philosopher. It goes like this, quote, A man's character and his fate are two names for the same concept. We could argue that Emile's present self makes up his character, but that Damien is his fate. That's why the painting seems to resemble both. They're the same thing, only captured at different times. At the end of the chapter, Emile is once again longing for Damien's guidance. He brings up a meeting he had with Damien a while prior to his painting, while he was visiting his parents over the holidays. He tells us that he omitted to bring this up earlier in the story because of the shame that it caused him. During this meeting, Damien lightly admonishes Emile for his new lifestyle and his aimlessness, but then points out that such a phase is not abnormal for young men who would later come to terms with their spirituality, bringing up St. Augustine again as an example. He then says, quote, Inside of us, there's a self that knows everything, wills everything, does everything better than we do. That's what Damien is for Emile. He's always a step ahead, sometimes many steps ahead, and is always able to recognize where Emile is on his journey and where he needs to go next. Damien himself is the end of Emile's journey. He is the ideal that Emile aspires to. That ideal lives within him, in his idea of Damien, and this is what allows him to break free from all of these other tempters that come between him and himself. And finally, what allows him to, at last, live that life that is spontaneously welling up within him. But we are getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Emile still has more to do. He has recognized the folly of his drunken lifestyle, and he has recognized that the power of Beatrice, which is also, in some respects, the power of Damien, has, in some measure, come from within himself. What he needs to do next is empower that part of himself, to let it free and let it take control, 
rather than running from it. Emile has a dream in which he sees Damien holding the coat of arms from his childhood home, that coat of arms he had often seen Damien staring at and sketching. The coat of arms depicts a sparrowhawk, and in the dream, Damien convinces Emile to swallow it. The bird remains alive within Emile's stomach and begins to eat at Emile from within. When Emile awakes, he sets about painting this bird, now a bird of prey, emerging from the egg that had contained it. This is a metaphor for Emile's inner demon, his Damien, this ideal self that exists within him that he needs to embody. He needs to let it eat its way out from within himself. He can't will this so much as he can let it happen, but for it to happen, he needs to get himself straight first. He can't run away into the intoxicating power of drink or lust. His idealization of Beatrice is in some way religious, but its religious content is still superficial. It is in the next chapter that Emile will truly reckon with the religious spirit. Chapter 5 and 6 the Pistorius Arc. At the end of chapter 4, Emile sends his painting of the Sparrowhawk to Damien. As a reply, he receives a note curiously left in one of his school books. He immediately recognizes the note as being from Max Damien, who has somehow snuck into Emile's classroom during a break. Uh, again, this is another instance where it, it might be worth considering whether or not Max Damien is real or how real he is, and we'll get into that again uh, at the conclusion. The, the note that Damien leaves for Emile explains that the egg is the world, and that anyone who wishes to be born must destroy a world. Quote, the bird is flying to God, it says. The God is named Abraxas. This God Abraxas is the god foreshadowed in chapter 3, when Damien spoke of the god that must also contain the devil within himself. Abraxas is, in real life, a sort of enigmatic figure in Gnostic religion, about which there is much scholarship and, consequently, much disagreement. In this story, his meaning is quite simple. Abraxas is a symbol for a god that is different from the Christian god, in that he accepts responsibility for both the good and the bad in the world. The lack of concrete information regarding Abraxas, Emile even searches an entire library at one point and comes up with nothing, allows the characters to say whatever they like about him, and use him for their philosophy in the same way that Damien deracinates Cain and the thief on the cross from their original Christian contexts. At the same time as learning about Abraxas, Emile starts to lose faith in his newfound religion or idolization built around Beatrice. He finds that he can't repress his sexual urges like this forever, and begins once again to dream and to lust. He begins to have a recurring dream that he describes as, quote, the most important and memorable in my life so it behooves us to pay a certain amount of attention to it. In this dream, Emile returns to his childhood home, where he falls into his mother's embrace. But as he embraces her, he realizes that his mother is not just his mother, but that she is also someone else, a tall and powerful figure that we will later meet as Lady Eve. This figure seems to combine motherhood and femininity with that portrait Emile painted in the previous chapter, the one that resembled both himself and Max Damien. This embrace seems to Emile to be, quote, a divine service, but also a crime. It fills him with bliss and comfort, but also fear similar to the dream presence of Damien when he tortured Emile during chapter 2. There is also an implied sexual thrill, which confuses Emile due to the figure's connection with both 
his mother, and Max Damien. What Emil comes to recognize about this dream is that what he is embracing is the god Abraxas, this figure that combined the bright world and the dark world, the familiar safety and innocence of his childhood combined with the guilt of his mature sexual lust. Quote, Rapture and terror, man and woman combined, deep guilt quivering in the heart of gentle innocence. This amalgam of paradoxes is Abraxas. It is accepting the world as it is, and realizing that all things and all feelings have their place within it. You can't understand the world if you hide from its darker aspects. Emil began his life repressing his sexual desires in the form of sin and guilt. Later, he transformed these feelings into his deification or idolization of Beatrice. In both instances, he is failing to reckon with them for what they truly are, and by extension, what all human feelings are. We are both human and animal. We have base lusts, but also high, sophisticated ideals. Abraxas is the god of why not both. Emil, upon realizing this, uh, goes a little crazy. He can't fully internalize this new understanding. He can't transcend his binary moral system. He can only bounce back and forth, as we've seen him do throughout the novel. He is enveloped by passions. Ideas swarm about in his head, but he has no control over them. What he is missing is a will, a desire strong enough to provide focus to his life. While other people study to become doctors or lawyers, Emil has no such purpose. He has the beginnings of a philosophy, but no knowledge of how to actually apply this philosophy to his real life. It is during this confusion that Emil passes by a church, from which he hears emanating the sound of an organ, and discovers in this music a yearning similar to his own, a deep religious passion disconnected from commonplace piety, a, quote, frenzy of devotion and a profound curiosity for the miraculous. He follows this organ player one night into a tavern and learns that his name is Pistorius, and that he is the prodigal son of a pastor, as well as being a musician and a scholar of ancient esoteric texts. The two immediately sense a sympathy in their pursuits. Pistorius recognizes Emil as a cut above the normal type of person, as someone who is searching for the truth of the world. Pistorius hopes to discover this truth via the study of theology. He practices a syncretic sort of religion, borrowing aspects from Christianity, Gnosticism, and Buddhism, among others. He practices solitary rituals, even at times worshipping fire, spending evenings with a meal staring into the fireplace as a form of meditation. Pistorius becomes Emil's new mentor, sharing ideas that have much in common with those of Max Damien. However, unlike Damien, Pistorius does not have that overwhelming presence, that charisma, force of will that inspires confidence and respect. While he is a profound elitist, considering people like himself to be above the average person who he compares to fish, sheep, worms, leeches, ants, and even bees, he himself is not an overman. Far from it, really. He's much more like the real Friedrich Nietzsche, as opposed to Damien who embodies the Nietzschean ideal. Pistorius is a teacher and a talker. We must remember Damien's previous warning to avoid smart talk, which only alienates you from yourself. Pistorius lives this alienation. He preaches the same path as Damien, but he only preaches. He has not severed his connections to the world and gone it alone. Instead, he lives with his parents and is looking to get a job in the church as an organ player and a pastor. 
While he studies esoteric texts in solitude, what he truly desires is to be able to share his religion with the masses. Quote, it has to be the religion of the community, he says. When he practices his mysteries by himself, it's, quote, not the real thing. Emile is, at first, enraptured by Pistorius's profound knowledge and accepts him as a new mentor. In a certain sense, he doesn't have much of a choice. At this point in his life, he still needs that mentorship to save him from his all-encompassing confusion. But gradually, the veil falls from his eyes. It begins when he encounters Pistorius one night, hobbling home drunk from the nearby tavern. Pistorius is so far gone in this moment that he doesn't even recognize Emil as he passes by. While in the moment, Emil censures himself for such a moralistic judgment as condemning Pistorius' alcohol uh, use, he understands from experience that intoxication does not lead to spiritual fulfillment, but instead, like many things do, only alienates one's self further. In the midst of his time with Pistorius, Emil encounters another, even more pathetic figure. A, <clears throat> a younger student named Nauer approaches Emil after school one day, drawn by his air of spirituality. We see here a sort of bizarro world inversion of Emil and Damien's initial relationship. While Damien approached Emil in the hopes of teaching him, here Nauer approaches Emil with the hopes of being taught, bringing a sort of desperation into the whole thing that is very off-putting. Emil has little interest in helping him, but listens to him briefly to find out what he's about. Nauer's main focus seems to be on sexual abstinence, in his words, continence. This is a doctrine as old as time, and we see it around today on online message boards that promote abstaining from all sexual acts, including masturbation, in order to increase testosterone levels, boost confidence, cure depression, etc., etc. It's presented as a sort of cure-all for the many maladies that are epidemic among young men. This follows the modern trend of using scientific claims as the basis for what are ultimately spiritual matters, similar to the psychiatric co-opting of religious meditation practices. What's at the heart of it, really, is an attempt to take control of one's life by proving that one can resist mere animal needs via mental fortitude. It is about not being a slave to one's passions. What we see in young Nauer, however, is that his obsession with negating these passions has only made them stronger. His sexual fantasies have become completely overwhelming, and have morphed into forms that frighten even him. His whole life, it seems, is a constant battle with the demons raging within him. Through this battle, his very idea of humanity has become warped. By demonizing his natural sexual feelings, he has come to the conclusion that humans are innately sinful and ugly. Emile is, of course, no stranger to these problems, as we've seen in his own repressive tendency toward his sexual feelings. In fact, this is something Emile has yet to overcome at this point in the story, and therefore he has no advice to give. He says, quote, I became taciturn and felt humiliated because someone was seeking advice for me and I had none to give. In response, Emile acts sarcastically and is rude and aloof. He has none of the charm and personability of Damien, because that all came from Damien's complete understanding and confidence in himself. Emil is simply not ready to be a teacher. He tells Nauer, quote, In such matters, people can't help each other. No one helped me, either. This is obviously a complete lie, as we've seen that Emil would have been totally hopeless without Max Damien. 
how can he hope to be a teacher when he can't even recognize that he himself has been taught? After this encounter, Emile once again has his dream of Lady Eve, and this time he paints the figure upon awakening. Once again, it seems to resemble Damien and also himself, and he stands before it, praising and deprecating it in turn, desperate to understand what it means to him. By the end of this process, he says, quote, I wanted to kneel down before it, but it was so firmly inside of me that I could no longer separate it from myself, as if it had become my pure ego. Later, he retains a vague memory of burning the painting and eating the ashes. In a sense, we can understand this as Emile overcoming the external Damien and recognizing the Damien that is within him, and recognizing also that he must play the role of Damien for young Nauer. He remembers the passage from the Bible in which Jacob fights with the angel of God and attains the name Israel. And he quotes Jacob, quote, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This quote offers an insight into the teacher-student relationship here. Emile, without knowing it, was desperate for Damien's help and seemed to summon him in his times of most need. Now it is Emile's turn to be needed and to be summoned. Waking up in the middle of the night, Emile finds himself prompted by a mysterious impulse to head out into the town and finds himself at a construction site that resembles where his own spiritual journey began when Cromer blackmailed him. Here he finds Nauer. Emile doesn't know why he's come here. When Nauer asks how he found him here, Emile tells Nauer that he wasn't even looking for him. Nauer has unconsciously brought Emile here, using that power that Damien described earlier, of being able to bend the universe to one's whim if one feels strongly enough. Emile finds Nauer in truly dire straits, on the verge of suicide, and it was this desperation that drew Emile here. During their short conversation, Emile tells Nauer, quote, We're not pigs, as you think. We're human beings. We create gods and fight with them, and then they bless us. This is exactly what Emile has been doing with Damien, with Beatrice, and with Abraxas. He has deified these beings, but in so doing has come to understand where they fall short the ways in which they just aren't enough. They can't offer Emile a full understanding of himself. They are only aspects of a bigger picture. Thus, Emile must reject them, find their weaknesses in order to be blessed by them. Blessed, that is, with a deeper knowledge of himself. Nauer, meanwhile, comes to deify Emile in his own right, insisting that Emile teach him how to contact spirits or understand the Kabbalah, things which Emile knows nothing about. The image of Emile that exists in Nauer's head is entirely divorced from the true Emile. He imagines Emile to contain knowledge that he himself desires. He sees Emile as the self that he wants to become. This is exactly the nature of the Max Damien that we meet in this book. We see him as Emile sees him, but what Emile is really seeing is his own idealized self, projected onto a person who is mysterious and reserved enough to facilitate such projection. Max Damien himself is not a spirit or a ghost or a figment of Emile's imagination. In all likelihood, He's just a weird guy that Emile met at school, in the same way that we know Emile to be just a weird guy struggling to understand himself. Nauer eventually ends up silently drifting out of Emile's life, we can assume in order to find the appropriate spiritual teacher for the next phase of his journey. Pistorius, on the other hand, must be actively overcome. 
Pistorius's presence has become a comfort to Emil. He clings to him long after it becomes clear that their paths must diverge. Pistorius has provided Emil with a more systematic, a more religious understanding of what it means to come to terms with oneself, but at the same time, he has become trapped within this religious framework. What finally severs this relationship is an idle comment Emil makes one night, when he asks Pistorius to tell him something true, something personal, instead of all this religious talk, which he disparages as, quote, so damned antiquarian. Pistorius, despite all his unorthodoxy and syncreticism, is of a priestly nature. What he wants is a set of rules passed down through antiquity. He doesn't want to create anything new. He wants a book that he can show to everyone and say, hey, look, this is the new religion. But such a person is inherently incapable of actually founding that new religion. Jesus, Muhammad, Damien, what they do is refashion these old truths, reinterpret the old stories in order to communicate something radically new. They have that charisma, that divine inspiration, that allows them to put their lives on the line for the sake of these truths. Pistorius doesn't have that courage or that confidence. He needs to read it in a book for it to be true. Unfortunately for him, the book he needs hasn't been written yet. Esoteric pseudo-Egyptian Greek treatises cannot tell you who you are. They can't show you how to live your life. None of these books can, esoteric or otherwise. The Bible or the Quran won't either, not on their own. They all require the reader to bring something of their own. They require the reader's belief, and it is only through that belief that we can gleam anything from their words. As with the story of the thief on the cross that we discussed in part one, the story only matters if the crucifixion of Jesus is a significant moment, and that only matters if Jesus is a significant person. To believe this already requires a certain amount of faith in the person of Jesus, whether this is due to his charismatic, intellectual, or spiritual power, or simply because of his legendary status in our culture. Pistorius does not have religious faith. He doesn't believe any of these stories wholeheartedly. If he did, he wouldn't be searching for new ones all the time. What he wants is something to devote himself to. What he wants, really more than a religion, is a church. He has abandoned the Protestant church because of its rationality, that it has placed reason before faith. He claims that, quote, our religion, that is Protestantism, is practiced as if it weren't one. Ironically, putting reason before faith is exactly what Pistorius continues to do. The problem with introducing rationality into the religious world is that faith is inherently irrational. If it wasn't irrational, you wouldn't need faith at all. You'd only need logic. But logic can't replace faith because there are aspects of our world and our lives that can't be explained by reason or science, by virtue of being immaterial. You can't observe them. You can't find the soul with a microscope. It's only there if you believe it is. Pistorius makes an idle comment to the effect that he'd even rather be a Catholic if only because Catholicism retains those antique rites that, to his mind, make religion so powerful. The so-called ancients that he reads were writing in times when religion was the language of culture, of philosophy, and of science. The upshot of that is that it makes it seem, to modern readers, that they had a more direct connection with the spiritual, and thus that they had knowledge that we can no longer attain. What Emile realizes is that this is nonsense. It's just a trick of the way they talk. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's true. 
Furthermore, this antiquarian thinking closes off the possibility of gaining understanding in the here and now. This is antithetical to the Nietzschean ideal of self-actualization. There is no prerequisite knowledge to becoming an overman. All that's required is the courage and fortitude to grapple with one's self. If you are alive and have a self, then you are capable of understanding the world. Pistorius himself seems to understand all this. At the end of chapter 6, he admits to Emil that this longing for a church is his weakness, and that the only way to truly reach the new religion is by standing alone, naked and vulnerable, with no authenticated dogma to turn to. A true overman can't follow an ideal. He must be his own authentic self. This is why Emile had to overcome Damien, to burn his portrait and eat its ashes. He can't chase after someone else's tail anymore. He has to find his own way. Chapter 7 Lady Eve Now that Emile has overcome Damien as an ideal, he is ready to reunite with Max Damien as a person. But first, he must decide on a new quarry. The fate of someone like Emile is that of a seeker, always chasing after and pursuing an ideal, and by so doing, attaining the truth of their own self. Damien is an overman, but part of being an overman is reaching this state yourself. You can't just copy someone else. That's why Emile's focus in this penultimate chapter turns from Damien to Lady Eve. Lady Eve first appeared in chapter 4 as a sort of amalgamation of Emile's mother, Emile himself, and Max Damien. She becomes a reality when Emile visits Damien's old house in his hometown and sees a portrait of Damien's mother. This idea of motherhood as an archetype is actually first introduced in the novel's preface when Emile says, quote, we all have a common origin, the mother, or mothers, depending on your translation, but each of us strive toward his own goal. Lady Eve, as the mother of, da of Max Damien, embodies this archetypal role as the origin of life, either collective life or individual life. Obviously, her name, Eve, points to a collective motherhood, Eve being the first ever mother. By shifting his orientation from Damien to Eve, what Emile is doing is focusing now on the underlying philosophical foundation of overmanhood, rather than its specific representation in Max Damien. But first, he will be reunited with Max Damien himself, and develop a more equal relationship than the teacher-mentor relationship from earlier in the book. As tends to be the case in this novel, this encounter is pure chance. But of course, we know that chance is influenced greatly by the passions and desires of the main characters. In real life, this would be a chance encounter, but we know it was brought about by Emile and likely Damien himself as well. While walking through the town where he is attending university one night, Emile overhears a conversation between a man that he recognizes as Max Damien and a Japanese fellow whose name we never learn. The presence of the unnamed Japanese man has manifold implications. First, it shows that Damien is a global cosmopolitan sort of guy, not constrained by the culture he was born into. Second, their conversation reveals that this new phenomena of the Seekers is not specific to Germany or even Europe. As we will see later on, Damien's acquaintances are from all over, with religious and cultural backgrounds that span the whole globe. We find that no culture is more or less conducive to recognizing the truth. Hess's Orientalist tendencies might lead us to believe that the so-called East is somehow more enlightened or spiritual than Europe, but the truth that we see here is that enlightened people are rare anywhere, 
and that a key step in this enlightenment is overcoming one's mother culture. Damien introduces Emile to his mother, Lady Eve, shortly after their reunion, and we find that she functions as the nucleus around which all of these strange outcasts orbit. Lady Eve is, like Beatrice, the only other female character in the novel, a symbol of femininity as a whole rather than an individualized character. She plays a supporting role in the lives of the Seekers, never offering input into their conversation, but instead encouraging them with her smile and motherly gaze. While Beatrice works to a certain extent as a figment of Emile's imagination, a sort of fantasy woman of the kind that many young men create out of their crushes, the fact that both female characters in this novel function in basically the same way is a worthy object of criticism. From what we can tell from the text, the idea here seems to be that the role of women is not to seek the truth or go on their own spiritual journeys, but instead to support men in doing these things. This is just one way in which the kind of archetypal symbolism Hess employs in the novel perpetuates social norms, even in a novel where other similar norms are being criticized. When Emile meets Lady Eve, he says to her, quote, I think that all my life I've always been on a journey, and now I've returned home. This brings us back to the idea of the prodigal son from the first chapter. I mentioned that Emile's journey would not be that straightforward, and it wasn't. However, there is still this sense of the homecoming. Emile is not returning to his familial religious or cultural beliefs, and in fact, it seems that his biological family is no longer a factor in his life at all. When he goes home for Christmas vacation at the end of this chapter, he doesn't mention his family. He only talks about the fact that he has to leave Lady Eve for a while. What Emile has instead returned to is something more primal, something beyond his individual origin. His home is the self that he was born to become. Somehow, through being born and raised, he had lost access to this central aspect of his being. But now, at the conclusion of his spiritual journey, he can finally say that he is himself. He is no longer confused and afraid. He no longer needs to pretend. It seems that Emile is finally beginning to live that life that was spontaneously welling up within him. However, he continues to be tormented by the sexual desires that have plagued his life, now directed toward Lady Eve. This is probably the right moment to finally truly reckon with Emile's sexuality. In the Beatrice section, I briefly alluded to Emile being gay and in love with Max Damien. I'd like to take the opportunity now to try to understand what role Emile's sexuality actually plays in the novel. If we need further evidence of the sort of homoeroticism here, in this penultimate chapter, Emile comes across Damien working out shirtless, and we are told that he, quote, looked marvelous, followed by a description of his physical features, including his strong, capable arms and taut muscles. And we can't forget that the novel ends with Emile and Max Damien sharing a loving kiss. It's not hard to see that a key part of this entire process of overcoming the guilt and sin Emile associates with being himself is tied to the fact that the culture he lives in is unwilling to acknowledge or accept his sexuality, and that in turn, Emile himself finds his sexual feelings difficult to acknowledge. In his dreams, Emile often finds himself in situations where his feelings seem contradictory such as the dream from earlier in which Damien beats and terrorizes him and Emile accepts it with, quote, a mixture of pleasure and fear. We are led back again to the god Abraxas, the god that allows for contradiction and paradox. Human sexuality is not simple and binary. 
Emil is attracted to Damien, of course, but he's also attracted to Beatrice, both the real Beatrice, or the, the real unreal Beatrice, and the one in the painting, and Lady Eve, who we will return to in a second. And we can't just decide that all these attractions are illegitimate simply because we think he's gay, or because these feelings only exist in fantasy. Emile's journey is about overcoming the binary cosmology of the bright world and the dark world, about accepting yourself fully and completely, and not caring if such a full and complete picture contains contradictions and paradoxes. Emile's attraction to androgynous or, quote, boyish women isn't a cover-up or something for being gay, as it's sometimes made out to be. Androgyny is often considered an attractive trait to people of all genders and sexual orientations across myriad cultures and historical periods. Emile lives in a deeply conservative and sexually repressive culture, where sexual feelings outside of those between men and women are censured, and more often, simply unacknowledged. A large part of the dark world, bright world distinction was that the bright world is one of ignorance, that it refuses to see that which exists in the dark. This darkness contains basically all of human sexuality, so it's no surprise that Emile's dreams and fantasies are so confused. He simply doesn't have the concepts with which to deal with any of it. What Emile desires exactly from Lady Eve is ambiguous. In a way, the love seems a lot like his love for Beatrice. He says that at times he feels that Eve is, quote, only a symbol of my inner self. However, at other times he is, quote, aflame with sensuous desire, in her presence. Most tellingly, he relates to us that, quote, while reading a book, I gained a new insight, and it was the same feeling as being kissed by Lady Eve. Thus, like with Beatrice, it's hard to call this love in any realistic sense. More likely, what Emile has fallen in love with here is the pure idea of self-knowledge and self-actualization that he can now conceptualize directly. While before, he chased after phantoms such as intoxication, idolization, and esoteric religious doctrines, now he can worship the real thing, the primal origin. Lady Eve is the mother of Emile's ideal self, his demon, Max Damien. She is the catalyst that will allow Emile to become his full self, to live that life that is spontaneously welling up within him. In this way, she is the vector for his self-knowledge. And while, in my eyes, this is the most important role that Lady Eve plays, she remains a deeply mysterious and enigmatic figure, and trying to contain her within a single label or role is probably a fool's errand. Chapter 8, The Beginning of the End We now arrive at the novel's final chapter, The Beginning of the End. Emile, as we noted in the previous chapter, has reached maturity. His journey is far from over, but he seems to have made his way through the stormiest waters. What happens now is that the scope of the story changes. From the internal struggle of Emile Sinclair as an individual, we return to the collective struggle of humanity. At the end of chapter 7, after returning from his Christmas vacation, Emile goes to Damien's house only to find him in his near comatose meditative state that we first saw during communion class in chapter 3. Now, as then, this foreshadows Damien's exit from Emile's life, this time for good. When Emile leaves Damien's room, he comes across Lady Eve, who seems just as perturbed and distracted as Damien, and tells Emile to leave and come back later. Emile goes for a walk, and in the clouds of the brewing storm overhead, he sees the form of the sparrowhawk. When he returns, he finds Damien now awake and 
tells him of his vision. It appears to be linked with the visions that Damien experienced during his meditation, and it all points to a great cataclysmic rebirth that is looming. Damien mentions in his dream that he climbed a tower or a tree, and once on top saw a vision of the world in flames. This strongly resembles various shamanistic rituals, in which shamans spiritually ascend the tree or ladder that connects earth and heaven, and in heaven are given access to divine knowledge. In Christianity, we can recognize this archetype in the legend of Jacob's Ladder. Hess is deliberately invoking this symbolism to present Damien as a legitimate seer, and we know, historically, that what Damien foresees does, in fact, become real. Damien notes that, while many of his dreams apply specifically to himself, he can tell that this one applies to the whole world. This represents a massive change of scale. Most of the book has been focused almost solipsistically on Emile's inner journey and development. Now that Emile has become himself, or is at least capable of becoming himself, he can begin to look at the world and understand it in a way he could not previously. Much like how he needed to survive trials and tribulations in order to be reborn stronger, so does the world. Damien says, quote, No new thing can arrive unless an old thing dies. This cataclysmic event they are foreseeing is the First World War. It is first introduced in the novel as a looming presence in the previous chapter, when Damien and Emile are first reunited, and Damien, as is his wont, immediately turns the conversation to spiritual matters, and begins to expound upon the so-called spirit of Europe. In Damien's view, the people of Europe despite all wanting to follow the herd, are deeply isolated and discontent, and their sense of community is based on fear and anxiety. This fear stems from the fact that they haven't accepted themselves, that they understand subconsciously that the rules and ideals they live by are no longer valid, but they can't acknowledge it. This is classic Nietzsche. God is dead, but no one knows it yet. Damien says, quote, Whether the workers kill the owners or Russia and Germany shoot at each other, that will only mean a change of ownership. But it won't be all for nothing. It will show clearly just how worthless today's ideals are. There will be a clearing out of Stone Age gods. The world, as it now is, wants to die. It wants to perish, and it will. In this view, such a cataclysmic event is inevitable. Whether it's a global capitalist war or a workers' revolution, the key here is that something big must happen. Not because it would make the world better in itself, but because such an eruption of violence and chaos is the only thing that will snap the people of Europe out of their catatonic state. We have to remember that Hermann Hesse wrote this book as the First World War was still ongoing. The full consequences of the conflict for the future of Europe were yet unknown, and heavy government censorship meant that much of what we know about the conflict was not knowable to contemporary people. In a meaningful way, Hess is looking at the war not as a historical or even contemporary event, but as a catalyst for a new future. The way Damien seems to almost relish the upcoming murder of tens of millions of people is chilling, to say the least. He knows that the event will be terrible, chaotic, violent, and yet he wills it all the same. There's also present here the sort of elitism one would expect from Nietzschean philosophy. Damien and his fellow seekers, those born with the mark of Cain, are the people destined to bring about this future, to usher humanity into this new age. While everyone else will merely run along with the herd, the elect, the overmen, the quote, men of destiny, are quote, 
able to accomplish new unheard of things, and to save their species by means of new adaptations. This final evocation of evolutionary theory as applied to human civilization should immediately ring our alarm bells. It is easy, in the position that Damien and his friends find themselves, to hypothetically or even literally be willing to sacrifice other people for your ideals. They have come to think that they understand what the world wants, and what the world needs, not by asking people, but by looking deep into themselves, and thereby tapping into some seemingly more primal connection to the human spirit. But as we've seen throughout this novel, when you search into yourself, you get yourself, not anyone else. Emile has proven himself blind to what goes on around him and to the interiority of others, seeing all of them as reflections of himself. And we now see Damien making the exact same mistake. Max Damien is lionized in the novel, but we, the readers, have to be a bit more critical. The ideas he comes up with are often self-aggrandizing, self-justifying, a sort of apologia for who he is and how he acts. He's generous only to those he considers part of his group, those with the mark of Cain. In other words, those who he intuitively senses to be strong in some way. Now, strength is certainly not a bad thing, but it's also not necessarily an appropriate basis for selecting an elite. I mean, I don't think there is an appropriate basis for selecting an elite, but to be specific here, there are many instances in which acknowledging individual weakness leads to greater collective strength, and that's an idea that has no place in Damien's philosophy. On a personal level, I find Damien's views in this final section to be reprehensible. This is deeply uncomfortable because I have actually, in my life, gained a lot from reading Nietzsche and attempting to self-actualize and understand myself using aspects of his philosophy. Now, there's obviously never a direct, determined relationship between a philosopher and those who follow, but it's impossible to ignore the fact that this sort of elitism and this idea of enforcing one's will and using one's strength, whether other people like it or not, is a key aspect of Nietzsche's philosophy. The novel itself is not explicitly critical of any of this. Like I said earlier, the idea of social responsibility just does not show up in Hess's early work. While he expands Emile's struggle to this global level through the symbol of the First World War, it's notable that this transition still treats humanity as one collective individual, not as an amalgam of various cultures, beliefs, or even personalities. Damien's type is considered the ideal, the type who is willing to put their life on the line for some sort of principle. And the way that Damien conceptualizes himself is the way that humanity as a whole is meant to conceptualize itself. This is an extremely limiting view, and this is what leads Damien to celebrate something as horrific as the First World War, as if this war is what the general population actually wants, instead of the result of a political situation and the specific desires of the people in power. It always pays to tread cautiously when you find that someone's individual ideology is so deeply compatible with the desires of colonial military states. Now, when the war actually arrived, Damien's gung-ho attitude reveals itself immediately to be naive. Damien realizes in this last dream that the war will be far more terrible than he previously imagined. His youthful ideal of burning it all down feels a lot different in reality than it does in fantasy. Damien and Emile realize that they too will have to live through this apocalypse, and there's no guarantee that they will make it out unharmed. 
However, at the same time as it is deemed necessary for humanity, the war also seems necessary for Emile's further development. During the summer prior to its outbreak, which Emile describes as a, quote, dream island, Emile lives with Damien and Lady Eve in their earthly paradise. He is able to retreat from the world and devote himself, quote, exclusively to beautiful, pleasant things and ideas. But Emile knows this retreat is only temporary, and that soon he will have to return to struggle. Quote, I wasn't meant to exist in the lap of plenty and ease. I needed torment and persecution. It seems that one can't achieve self-actualization by running from the world. One must instead face it head on. On a day when these feelings of the impermanence of his situation weigh heavily on his mind, Emile decides to test out his powers by calling for Lady Eve psychically from his home. However, Damien arrives in her stead. Emile desires the safety and comfort of Lady Eve, but it seems the universe realizes that what he truly needs is Damien, the man who will push him forward whether he likes it or not. Damien tells Emile that war has broken out between Germany and Russia, which of course signifies the beginning of the First World War, that calamity they had so often yearned for. Emile is particularly elated by this idea that he is now a part of the destiny of the world, that he will now participate in the grand machinations of world historical events. Emile's experiences in the war make up only a few brief pages at the end of the novel. What Emile sees happening around him is exactly what he has trained himself to see, humanity evolving as it acknowledges its primal urges. For Emile, and as far as he can tell for the people around him, the war is not about military or political objectives. The material conditions are totally irrelevant. In his eyes, the soldiers are not fighting the enemy, but instead embodying a primal urge within themselves to kill and destroy in order to bring about the new world. As we are keenly aware, this is what Emile feels rather than what he actually sees. This is made more clear during Emile's final experience in the novel. As he is standing guard one night, he sees a vision in the sky of millions of people pouring out of a vast city, and in the midst stands a giant figure resembling Lady Eve. She screams in pain, the mark on her forehead shines brightly, and out of it shoots thousands of stars flying through the sky. One of these stars lands near Emile, throws him into the air, and when he next awakes, he is in a military hospital. In a symbolic sense, we can see the stars of the people of Europe being sent forth by Lady Eve, the mother, the primal urge, to sacrifice themselves in destruction for the rebirth of the world. Literally, what Emile is witnessing is an artillery barrage. When he wakes up, he sees in the cot next to him Max Damien. Damien asks him if he can still recall Franz Cromer, that bully from their childhood. Emil has noted several times during the novel that during all their other interactions, they never acknowledge Damien saving Emil from Cromer, likely because Emil couldn't accept the weakness inherent in the fact that he needed to be saved. But now he is able to accept what Damien has been for him, a a teacher, a mentor. Damien tells Emil that he's going to depart, aka die, and he tells Emil, quote, you'll have to listen within yourself, and you'll notice that I'm inside you. He then gives Emil a kiss on the lips, supposedly sent from Lady Eve. Emil falls asleep. When he awakes, Damien is gone, and the person on the cot next to him is a total stranger. The novel ends like this, quote, Whenever I descend all the way into myself, where the images of destiny slumber in the dark mirror, I need only lean over the black mirror to see my own image, which now looks exactly like him, him, my friend 
and guide. I've chosen to make no definitive claim as to the reality or unreality of Max Damien. I have laid out for you all the ambiguities present in his depiction, the times when his appearance is unworldly, the times when it seems that Emile is projecting something onto him, but also the times when it seems clear that he is a real person in the real world. With his death, Max Damien has sacrificed himself for the ideal he believed him. This loss causes Emile great pain, but at the same time there is no loss, because Damien, like all other people in Emile's life, is internal to him. Damien, whether real or not, is a part of Emile's inner spiritual life, and that life cannot be broken into by the material world. The dark mirror within shows Emile his shadow. Damien is Emile's ideal self, but he's also a tempter, just like all the other tempters that have captured Emile's soul. Damien, as we've discussed, is demonic in the way that he views other people as instruments for his goals. He only considers the well-being of those like him, those who he can incorporate into himself, who share his goals and his beliefs. But Emile is not Damien in the end. Damien is only a part of him. The fact that he sees him in a dark mirror, not just any old mirror, shows to me that Emil recognizes that there are aspects of Damien that he must fight against. Remember what he said earlier to Nauer, quote, We create gods and fight with them. My hope would be that Emil can overcome Damien's overpowering influence, that he can pursue self-knowledge and self-actualization in a way that doesn't involve the manipulation of other people. Now, there's not much evidence that this is what he's going to do. Perhaps it's only my own blind hope. In the end, it's of no importance what Emil does next. What's important is what we do with his story. This novel is especially affecting for young people who feel out of step with the culture that surrounds them. We can relate to Emil, to his confusion, his struggles, and also his feeling of destiny regarding his life. We too can feel the allure of Max Damien with his charismatic power. At the same time, we can recognize that darkness that comes with that power. Damien is a novel about becoming oneself. That's something we all end up doing, whether we like it or not. Emile is conscious of his attempt to become himself. He conceptualizes it using often religious motifs. Hess draws on an understanding of a wide variety of spiritual practices and beliefs, using tales that we know to lead us through this journey toward understanding. He was greatly interested in the archetypal thinking of Carl Jung, and we can definitely see this influence in the language and symbolism of the novel, and also in this idea that all people, regardless of their culture or religion, share some primal urge toward self-discovery. I think Emile's personal journey is where the novel excels. When it comes to the idea of a world historical psyche, I find myself less convinced. However, Emile's journey is so well-constructed and so heartfelt that the novel shines nonetheless. Hess captures the non-linearity of any spiritual journey. As soon as Emile feels he's made progress, he finds some defect in his understanding and is seemingly thrown back to where he began. But each stumbling block only makes him stronger and even those beliefs he has overcome still play a role in his intellectual development. Importantly, Damien doesn't end with any sort of lesson. Emile coming to terms with himself doesn't happen in a specific dramatic moment, if it can even be said to happen at all. At the end of the book, Emile is still just a young man, still confused, still in pain. 
And in the end, Max Damien remains memorable because despite the clarity of his personality, the question of his actual existence remains ambiguous. In fact, much of what goes on in the novel can be obscure on first reading. Like many great novels, Damien encourages one to read more deeply and think more deeply about what one has read. I hope that with this series I have been able to shine a light on some of the more obscure elements of the novel, and I would like to thank you all for coming along with me on this journey. You can find Balkwell's books on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you find podcasts, and it's also available on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please tell a friend uh, if you think they'd enjoy it too, and rate and review the show on uh, any platform where you can do so. You can visit my website at balkwell.online, where I post nonfiction essays every two weeks. And you can also check out my novel, Only in Dreams, available on Amazon. The show's new theme song is by Max Miller, a.k.a. Fun Bill. Big thanks to them for the great music, and it's very nice to actually have a theme song and not have to just find some random music every month. Next month we will be covering Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, a lesser-known work from a very well-known author, which is always exciting. That will be a one-off show, not a series like this one has been. So look forward to that. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.